Good morning. Um, it's wonderful to be here. I want to thank Dr. Douglas and Ron and Ms. Brito for having me. Um, it's my pleasure to be here to speak to you today about this topic. I want to start with a little bit of a warning, which is, all right, now I'm settled. My topic is not an easy one. The Holocaust is difficult to talk about. Gender-based violence and rape are especially difficult to talk about. And so if at any point during this conversation you need to exit this conversation, I encourage you to do that. Um, I will do my best to make it a discussion. I will ask you questions and hopefully you will answer them. Many of you are teachers. I'm gonna ask you which ones so I know who to call on because you'll feel compelled to answer my questions. Um, I'm the child and sister of teachers. I've learned a thing or two. Um, I wanna start with a story. Uh, so the woman in the center here is Sarah Riggler. And I'm gonna tell you her story today. And I'm gonna use her story to talk about a phenomenon that happened at the end of the Holocaust. Um, but before I get to Sarah, I wanna tell you a story about my family. When I was a little girl, my grandmother told me her stories of the Holocaust. She told me her stories of life before. She talked very openly. As a note, my grandfather, who was also a survivor, never spoke. Start with some gender issues there, right? Um, and one day, I must have been maybe 12, I was reading a book on the stairway above our kitchen, and my mother didn't know I was there. She was on the phone with one of her best friends, and I heard her mention the fact that my grandmother had been raped by the Soviet army at Liberation. Nobody ever said it in front of me. My grandmother took another 15 years to even reference it to me, only when she knew I knew. And I wondered for a long time about this, because my grandma talked about everything, or so it seemed. She talked about all sorts of really hard things from the war, but she didn't talk about this one. And so when I had the opportunity in college and in grad school to start asking my own questions, this was the question I asked. This happened to my grandmother, I knew it. Did it happen to other women? Why did it happen? Why did these men do this? And why did no one ever talk about it? And those are the questions I want to go through with you all today. I'm gonna to use Sarah's story to start to show you that this happened. And then we're going to talk about why and hopefully at the end, we'll have an opportunity to talk about the silence. Because in issues of gender-based violence, especially when we're talking about rape, silence is the thing we hear most. And I think it's important, especially for the conversation you're gonna have this afternoon, to really be thinking about and interrogating that silence and understanding the part that we all play in that. So, I wanna have a sense of who I'm talking to today. So how many of you are classroom teachers? Great, okay. How many of you teach here at the college? Okay. Um, how many of you are relatives of Holocaust survivors? Great, okay. Um, any other students? How many of you are students? Great, wonderful. Thank you for being here today. All right, let me begin. So as I said, the woman in the center here is Sarah Riggler. She's the slightly older looking than the rest of them one. Um, this is a picture I took of her my guess is in 2009, so 10 years ago, with a group of my students at the time. These are military students. For a long time, I gave this talk, I still do actually, to members of the armed forces. It's a little bit of a different talk then, um, as you may think. Sarah comes in to tell her story. She still does, actually. She's still alive. But today, she lives in Texas, not in New York City. Um, but she's still telling her story. This is Sarah as a child in Lithuania. Next to her is her sister, Hannah. They grew up in the town of Shavel, Lithuania. That's the Yiddish name for the town. I don't use the Lithuanian name simply because I cannot accurately pronounce it. Um, so I stick with the Yiddish, which is also how Sarah refers to her hometown. They had a lovely childhood by all accounts. They had a beautiful apartment with a garden. She got along relatively well with her sister. She always says that her sister was prettier than she was, and so she was a little bit jealous, and people liked her sister better. I don't totally know if that's true, but they went to Lithuanian school, and they went to Hebrew school, and so they learned Lithuanian, Russian, Hebrew, and English. 
Every summer they went to the town of Palangan on the Black Sea with their cousins and aunts and uncles. They celebrated Jewish holidays together as a family. They had a very strong Jewish identity. And again, by all accounts, a beautiful childhood. This would all change in 1940 when Sarah was 12. That's when the Russians occupied Lithuania as part of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. This is the non-aggression pact between Germany and Russia. I'm gonna try and be as um, explanatory as I can with the history, so if I'm repeating things you know, I apologize, and if I'm telling you things you don't and you have questions, I encourage you to raise your hand and ask. And as I said, I'm going to try and make this as interactive as we can. There's gonna be some text study in a couple of slides. Um, I am capable of standing up here and talking about it for an hour or much longer, but we'll all enjoy it more if that's not exactly how this goes. So, all right. Um, so you can see here the line that was created. Can I do this? Yeah. Um, when the Germans and the Soviets split Eastern Europe. This line impacted enormously the experience of the occupied people and what their Holocaust experience would be like. Because for many, for those east of the line, the Holocaust didn't start when it started west of the line. When we talk, for example, about something I'm not gonna talk about today, but feel compelled to mention anyway, about the differing experiences of Jews in occupied Poland, because there was no Poland, in occupied Poland, those who were in the west and those who were in the east will have very different experiences, in part because of how the Soviets treated Jews during their occupation. They privileged Jewish communities, gave more access, gave more power to the Jewish communities because they trusted them more. Um, and so when the Nazis come in later, local people are going to be very, very angry at what they perceive as oppression under the Soviets by Jews. Again, not really relevant today, but any time I can try and unpack some of Jewish history, I, I try to do it. So when the Soviets came in, Sarah's life changed, of course. They were forced to share their home with a Russian pilot. And their factory was nationalized. And actually, Sarah's family, because they were owners, business owners, um, were not treated so well. Her father was arrested, and her whole extended family was sent to Siberia. This turns out later to be lucky, because they survived the war by living in Siberia for it. Sarah's war with Germany will start on Sunday, June 22nd, 1941, so about a year later, when Germany declares war on the Soviet Union. They break the non-aggression pact. And things begin to change. Um, so this is a map of that part of Eastern Europe after Germany comes in. Sarah's home, this is a hard angle for me, but Sarah's home um, here, that's the ghetto. That's the Lithuanian name of Shavel. I pronounced it badly once in front of a Lithuanian and so I just have never done it again. Um, it was really embarrassing. Uh, yeah, you can imagine. Um, so that starts on Sunday, right? By Thursday, four days later, the Germans have taken the town. Immediately, the Jews are forced to wear the yellow star, and then Sarah's father, together with many others, that day, is taken, forced to dig his own grave, and shot, four days into her war. Ghettos are formed immediately throughout the German-occupied lands, and Sarah, Hannah, and their mother are moved into the ghetto. Ghetto life is incredibly difficult, right? Everyone works, everyone starves. Hannah, Sarah's sister, is raped in the ghetto by a drunk Nazi soldier. Luckily, she does not become pregnant. And this is how life goes on for three years. I'm gonna move to the next slide. So I wanna give you guys another second to look at this in case it's useful. These are all, these maps, by the way, are all available at the USHMM website, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum website. They're incredibly useful for understanding how these boundaries change. Because as the boundaries change, life really changes for the people under occupation. Okay, um, so this is summer 1944. The Soviets are advancing. They're starting to take back Eastern Europe. Sorry, it's January 44. They're starting to take back Eastern Europe. And as they do, they discover the concentration camps. So their first camp is Majdanek, which is outside Lublin um, in what was Poland. And that's the first time they begin to see what's happened. They come upon these storehouses of clothes, of children's clothes, of shoes. And all of a sudden, they have a sense of the mass numbers of people who have disappeared. And this is summer of 44, and they start to write about it, actually, in Soviet Army papers, uh, literal newspapers. Um, 
In the summer of 1944, they then come upon the Operation Reinhardt camps, which are the concentration camps that are solely death camps. Um, Sobibor, Belzec, Treblinka. These camps had already been shut down, in large part because their job was done. They had been built for one geographic area. They destroyed all of the Jews in that area. They're shut down, plowed under. And the Russians start to come upon the remains of these camps. So they're really beginning to figure out something had happened here. This is going to be important later, right? What I'm saying is they know. They know there's been extermination. They've seen the evidence of it. Um, other Soviet armies at the same time are coming up on Lithuania, right? So again, this is January. We're talking about around here. They start to move. Sorry, it's an awkward angle. I don't mean to make you guys car sick. Um, they start to move westward. The Germans know this. And I think as hopefully everyone in this room knows, they don't leave the Jews to be found. They start moving the Jews westward also, moving them into Poland, moving them into Germany, because they want to, on the one hand, use their labor. On the other hand, their goal is to erase all evidence and also to finish the job they've been doing. They want to kill as many as they can before the war is over. And they know they're going to lose the war. And they begin to talk in their writings about a glorious unwritten page in history. This is a direct quote. So Sarah, Hannah, and their mother, excuse me, um, are taken to a camp called Stutthof, and then onto four different work camps. They march from camp to camp, and miraculously, they manage to stay together. In December, they're forced to join a column of thousands upon thousands of women who are being marched towards Germany. This is one of the death marches. And they walk for a month, and women are dying around them. They're falling down from starvation, they're falling down from exhaustion, and people are being killed around them every day. As the march goes on, Sarah begins to worry for her mother. Her mother's getting really weak. Um, they're marching through a Polish village, and Sarah, and this is just, this is just what she's like, um, she says to her mother, I know you still have the diamond ring from Papa. Give it to me. I'm going to go in the village. I'm going to find food, and I'm going to come back. And her mother gives it to her. Sarah escapes the march. She leaves behind her mother and her sister, um, and she runs. She hides in a barn, she looks for someone to take the ring, she can't find someone, um, and the police start looking for her, so she hides and she hides, and then the barn door opens, and she's terrified. And of all things, it's a British soldier. There is a work camp there for British prisoners of war, which is really just an attic in a barn, in a farm, it's about 10 of them. Um, and one of them, Stan, takes her in. And this is what she says in her book um, that they say about her. Can I ask someone, this is where it starts to get interactive, I'll give you all a second to read it, but I ask you to call out what you see about how the POWs see her and the women on the march. What do they notice? I'll ask you a more specific question. What do they see of their humanity? <coughs> okay. I won't pick on you guys. Um, here we go. 300 matted haired, filthy objects that had once been Jewesses. They see how dehumanized these women have been. And they're struck by it, right? I mean, this first description, this is really evocative of the pain of the march, of the situation of these women. And yet, Willie and Stan take her in. And what happens is um, these men, a couple of them are communist. And you can see it. He says, drop it. We are comrades. And they vote. They're risking their lives taking her in. They're in a camp run by the Germans. But they vote, and they decide we're going to save her. And they do. Um, they bring her food. They take care of her for three weeks until they're evacuated. And actually, one of them says to her, you're so thin. You could be a boy. Switch places with me. Put on my clothes. 
evacuate with the, with the other soldiers. Remember, she speaks English, so she can speak to them. And she says, you've done enough. I'll stay here, I'll be okay. And they go, and they're evacuated. Now, Sarah is about to be liberated, it's the term we always use, right? By the Soviet army, by the Red Army. Um, and they have these expectations, Sarah and the thousands upon thousands of other women this is about to happen to, of what that liberation is going to be like. And they talk about those expectations. So when I did this research, I watched, I don't know, 30, maybe more, testimonies of women talking about liberation. And I'm going to share some of their quotes and their descriptions with you. Um, but they talk initially about how shocked the Soviets are, about how horrified the Soviets are, and what kind of treatment the Soviets try to give them, how they try to take care of them. Um, in some places, the Soviets get very, very angry, especially as they get to Germany, at the surrounding Germans, and they order them to start taking care of the women. They order them to give them homes. They order them to give them food. Um, there's a story in Leipzig, a woman named Luna recalls a Soviet on a motorcycle who got the elders of the town together and told them at gunpoint that he'll be back in three days and all these women better be sleeping in regular beds, in private homes, or he's going to kill all of the town elders. So initially, there is this recognition of what these women have gone through and there is this treatment with humanity. But this is going to change very quickly. The quote I'm going to show you in a moment is the only only reference to this I could find in traditional histories when I first did this research. I actually don't know if this has changed. I would assume that now if it has, the most you will find is in a book on women in the Holocaust, a line or two. But this um, is in a major Holocaust work, Martin Gilbert's Holocaust, A History of the Jews of Europe. And this is a quote from a survivor. I'll give you a moment to read it. I think we see a couple of important things here. First of all, when you're writing a history like this, you have to prove it happened. This shows you, right? It happened, she remembers very clearly. And the way she talks about it is really important. So first of all, in that second to third line, they celebrated with all the forthrightness and lack of restraint characteristic of Slavs. It's very bizarre from our perspective. But you have to remember, we're existing in a racialized context. And that even, um, Lena's German, she's a German Jew. There are these views about the people of the East that even non-Nazis hold. You have a Jewish woman saying that these men are somehow less, that this is something they expected of the Russians. The next line, they were reluctant to express their gratitude with their bodies. This is what's expected of them, right? The sense, aren't you our girls? Won't you give us this little thing after what we've done for you? These are pieces you hear over and over in these testimonies. The expectation of being thanked and the expectation that this is a thing a woman would give as a way to think and should give as a way to think. And then of course, she tells this very violent story. And I think one of the important things about what she says is we heard those words for a long time afterward. And I think that can tell us one of two things, or perhaps both. The first being, those were traumatic words for these women to hear, even after what they'd been through, that this is a deeply traumatizing experience to go through and to hear. Or it might be literal, that they went through this again and again for months. And she hears those words for a long time afterward. Now, I promised you I would tell you Sarah's story as a way to move through this history. So the Brits leave Sarah behind, and she hides for a little while, and then she comes out. Um, and she's, she's working. She's working on this farm. And she talks to the cook, um, and he's worried for her because now the soldiers are here, and he says that they've been reduced to the levels of animals. Again, 
this, this issue of humanization. The Soviets have fought a very, very brutal war. The Nazis purposefully used brutalization against the Soviet population and against the Red Army, both because it was an ideological war. They didn't believe these were humans they were fighting, and you don't have to stick to the Geneva Convention and the laws of war when you're fighting non-humans, but also as a way to demoralize the Soviet troops. That they thought that if the Soviets knew that their homes, that their villages, that their families had been destroyed, they would have a morale problem. I think what they didn't anticipate was the reverse, how hard these men would fight and how incredibly brutal they themselves would become because of what had been done to them. But you see it leaking out here and people know, and that's what this man is saying to Sarah, that they're not acting like humans anymore, they're acting like animals. And now Sarah says that one night she's in bed and a Jewish Russian soldier crawls into bed with her. And the way she describes it is, is absolutely, I still have trouble with this one. I don't know what to make of it. She says, I was able to stop his advances as he was not a brutal person. Compared to what she's seeing around her, a man trying to rape her in her own bed is not a brutal person. She said, though, he did threaten to take away the help he had promised, which tells you something about how vulnerable these women are. They need help from the Soviets. They need permission to work. They need permission to get on trains. They need permission to leave. They need permission to try to go home. And all they want, all anybody wants right now, is to try to go home and to see who's left and to see what's left, which is what Sarah's going to try to do. And this man tries to withhold his help because of it. I'm going to talk a little bit more about how this happened to other women. I keep feeling the need to warn you guys. This is very widespread. When you're looking for testimonies about rape at liberation, all you do is look for testimony about liberation by the Soviets, and you find this. So you see again in what Celia is saying that they expected this trade, this quid pro quo. They actually set up DP camps in existing concentration camps, and some of these are women only, and the women are afraid to stay there because the Soviets are guarding them and the Soviets are going to come in at night and rape them. You see that in what Judith Sternberg Newman is saying as well. People expect, I think still even, rape to be about sex. I think Judith is telling us very clearly that it's not. We're talking about children, we're talking about old women, and I also want you to think about who these women are, what they look like at this point, and what they've been through. These are skeletons, right? Think back to the way William Stan described them. Matted haired, filthy objects who were once Jewish, Jewesses. People who are no longer people. And yet, this is what's being expected of them and this is what's being taken from them, violently. The violence of these rapes are very, is very serious. These women are not in good physical condition. The rapes can disable them, they can kill them. The diseases that get passed along, these women have no ability to handle. Um, and so this is, in many ways, both violating and very violent. One of the things that comes out of this is that the women band together. So Sarah is trying to go home and she meets a woman named Sonia who's traveling with her. Um, and Sonia says, look, if this is going to happen to us, I will take it for you. You are young, you've never been married. I've been married. She doesn't want Sarah to be traumatized. She wants Sarah to maintain her virginity. And actually, they do do this. Um, as they're trying to get on a train, they have to get, again, permission, right, to travel. And as they go into the authorities' office to get the permission, the Russians take Sarah, the Soviets take Sarah, and uh, excuse me, Sonia, and they rape her on a table in the office at the train station. Again, this is not just happening at night in hidden places. This is happening in broad daylight. And Sarah says, then we got a note that we could go wherever we wanted, and we got bread. On a train later that day, authorities found us. We showed them the note, and they said, how many nights did you have to pay for that note? which means people know. This isn't isolated. 
it's well known throughout the Soviet system that this is happening, the Soviet army system that this is happening. You see other women um, who are deciding to stand up as well. This woman, Luna, watching her testimony, she was just absolutely my favorite. She says, like in this amazing, powerful tone, she said, a Russian officer decided that I'm going to beat his girlfriend. And then she pauses and she said, and I decided, like hell. And you can see the pride, right? That like she was taking control. She has had no control for years. She has not been able to say no to anything for years. They have no agency at all. And this is where she takes it back. And I think that's a part of it for Sonia too. She, don't, she knew one of them was gonna get hurt, but she had not been able to protect anyone for a long time and she protected Sarah. This is actually pretty common that older girls, older women will decide to bear the brunt of this for the younger ones if they can, right? Obviously sometimes it is not so orderly um, but you see women fighting back, both with their bodies, trading their own security for someone else's, and fighting back physically. And again, think of the physical condition of these women. To decide to take a chair and attack a soldier with it, you're risking your life, but it's worth it for them. As they're moving through Sarah, in a different incident, um, a soldier comes to her and tries to rape her, and she convinces him not to rape her. And again, um, look, sometimes it's violent and sometimes it's more individual, and Sarah is a very, very convincing person. She could talk almost anyone into almost anything. Um, but this is also one of the times that I wonder if she's telling the truth, that I wonder if she's able to say what happened. He wrote her a letter of protection saying that she was his bride and he was sending her home and that other men shouldn't touch her because she's his. And the note works, it protects her for a while um, as she's traveling. And again, this guy tried to rape her. When she convinces him not to, he knows other men might do it. This is again how widespread it is. You have other, kind of, other kinds of soldiers protecting women. Not everybody does this, though it's very prevalent. You have superior officers who stop their own men. Uh, you have superior officers who give up time, these women are attesting to it, to protect women. And in some cases, Jewish soldiers who realize these women are fellow Jews and feel a connection to them. Again, not always, right? You remember Sarah's story, but it does happen. And then you also sometimes have Jewish men. One night, Sarah and Hannah, excuse me, Sarah and Sonia um, are lying on a floor in a barn, sleeping, there's Jewish men there. And one of the men says, if they come in, I'm gonna say you're my wife. And they do come in. And one of the men claims Sarah and says, that's my wife, and the soldiers don't touch her. And one of the men claims Sonia and says, that's my wife, and the soldiers don't touch her. Which is interesting, that they respect, in that case, another man enough not to hurt his wife. There's an idea in rape theory, Susan Brown Miller writes, that rape is the ultimate boot in the face to the man. When you have killed men, when you have attacked their society, when you want to get to the heart of who they are as a man and destroy who they are as a man, you attack their woman. Because the inability to protect their woman will completely destroy their masculinity. Now, of course, it's interesting that rape in that thought is about men and not about the experience of the woman. But I think there's something there. And when we talk about other ways in which this happened at the end of the war, I think that's an important thing to think about. After all of this, Sarah and Sonia make it back to Lithuania. She makes it home. She meets a man, she gets married. It is not this man, it is not this wedding. Um, because he has a visa to America and she marries him so she can escape. Because when she gets home, nobody else is there. Her mother's not there and Hannah's not there. She gets to America, she divorces that man and she changes her name. She decides she's going to live the rest of her life for her sister, and she calls herself Hannah. And my whole life, I've always known her, or my whole professional life, I've known her as Hannah Riggler. She marries the judge, this is the judge, I adore him, um, and they have a really wonderful life. They have children, he becomes a judge, she teaches, she starts telling her story, I think in the 80s, and she decides, to find 
the POWs. And she does. And she goes to England and she reconnects with them. This is obviously them together. And she gets them honored by Yad Vashem in Israel as righteous among the nations. And this is their plaque in Yad Vashem, recognizing them for their heroics. We see here two different kinds of reactions to war on the part of the soldiers. And this is where I want to talk about why. Why some behaved one way to a teenager in trouble, and why some behaved another. And from there, hopefully, we can talk about the silence. So Sarah wrestles with this question. Hannah wrestles with this question. Why did some soldiers behave one way and some soldiers treated her so differently? And the women, they wrestle with it too. Why did this happen to them? And these are their answers. Sarah says that for her, these English soldiers cared enough to risk their lives to save a child. Part of it is they saw her as a child. They saw her as someone they could care about. They saw a connection. They saw the common humanity. I think part of it had to do also with their communism because this is a very ideological war again. And it is, especially in the East, thought of as a fight in part between fascism and communism. And they want to define themselves in opposition to the Nazis. And what the Nazis do is they destroy, especially the Jews. And these men were saying, we are not that. But they also, they came from England. There's anti-Semitism in England in the 1930s, certainly. There's anti-Semitism in America in the 1930s. But it's not eliminationist anti-Semitism, right? It's not thinking of these people as subhuman who need to be murdered. So you have to put their context into it as well. Also, they're healthy enough and a community. They're a democratic community, right? They vote on whether to keep her. And so they still have some of these ideals of their old life that have survived. And what about the Russians? I think this is an important one to read out loud. Clara says, and I don't know, shall I blame or not the animals, the men who are fighting for I don't know how many years on the front, and drank. I don't know, what should I say? You can hear in her words that she struggles with this, that she looks for an answer and cannot find one. She doesn't even know if she can call them human at this point because of what they've been through, the animals, right? Which is a way also of explaining away this behavior, of saying they're not human, we can't expect that of them. And she said, who were fighting for, I don't know how many years on the front. The Soviet soldiers have fought a very long war, and again, a very brutal one. And they drank. So the role of alcohol here is really interesting. As the Germans leave Eastern Europe, they burn the storehouses of food, and they leave behind the storehouses of alcohol. And so these men are starving, and all they have is alcohol. And it's a Russian stereotype, but it's actually true, I've studied it, that the way Russians drink is different in terms of the length of a binge. American binges are like eight hours or something. Russian binges traditionally are three days. Um, so the men are frequently very drunk. And the frontline soldiers may also be penal battalions. The Soviets have run out of soldiers because of the length and difficulty of their war. And they've started opening up prisons and using those prisons as battalions. And some of these battalions that will liberate the camps are filled with thieves and murderers and rapists. But that doesn't explain the prevalence. And the only thing I could think of that explained the prevalence is the brutality, is the ideology, is, the, is how these men have been dehumanized by this war. When they get to Germany, the Red Army will rape more than two million German women. Those are the women of their enemy, right? That quote about the boot in the face, this is where it becomes relevant. But they rape throughout Eastern Europe. They're known to have raped communist partisans in Yugoslavia, women who are on their side ideologically. It hasn't have to do with who these people are, with who the victims are. It has to do, in this case, with who the perpetrators are. Yes. 
So I wondered about that. Um, and I haven't been able to figure it out because we do have stories of Jews raping Jews. And many of the Soviets at this point are old enough to have been born in Soviet Russia, which means that religion has not been a factor for a long time in their lives, right? That they may have the ethnicity of religion. Judaism at this point in the Soviet Union is an ethnicity and not a practice. Um, but we haven't been able, I haven't been able to see it, that it's not an anti-Semitic act because they do it to the Poles, they do it to the Germans. I mean, they just, they just do it. I think it's an interesting question. Um, and we have to look at the prevalence of rape in the Soviet Union at the same time to see if it's, it's indicative of something that's a problem in the home society, which I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I don't think it is. Uh, and I will tell you, one of the things that was interesting to me when I started doing this is that I was friends with a, a Holocaust survivor who was also, he wasn't a survivor, he was an escapee, um, who'd become a soldier in the US Army. And I said something to him about this. And I said, I, you know, I don't think Americans raped in these numbers. And he was irate. And he said, of course we didn't. We're not Russians. And I thought, oh, okay. The only other forces we could find that raped at this kind of level, um, at least in Berlin, like in the occupation of Berlin, were the French Moroccan troops. They were known to rape. And you have their colonialism. Right? You have a colonized, oppressed people coming into a colonizing country, and you have a very sort of cultural, societal level anger being acted out there. There's a book that came out a few years ago called What Soldiers Do. That's about the American forces in France. And it's about the use of uh, the polite term is escaping me at the moment, uh, a for, let's say forced relationships. Um, between American soldiers and French women. So it's not that we don't do what they do because we're not Russian. This is a thing that happens with soldiers. This is a thing I think that happens with occupying armies and with situations of major power differential. Yeah. Yeah. So this, I think, happens not with the Jews, but with um, Berlin, with Germany. Uh, and it's so, I mean, it's, it's incredibly widespread. It's incredibly well known in, in the, the battle for, Ber you know, for Berlin and sort of the, the march into Germany. And they actually, after Berlin is taken, end up outlawing rape. But like way after, and they do it because it becomes a political problem. Once the occupation is in place, these stories about rape become an issue for, you know, for the others, for the important people, let's say, right, for the higher ups controlling the situation. And so they put in laws, and you can be shot for raping a civilian. At the same time, abortion is legalized to deal with the fallout from the rapes in Germany. So the, the interesting thing is, this is a story you can read about, what happens in Germany, what the Soviets do in Germany. You can read in all of the books. But what they do on their way there, what they do to the concentration camp survivors, you can't. And that brings me to the question of silence. Why isn't this part of the dominant narrative? Why isn't this something we talk about? We being historians, we being survivor families, we being teachers. Yeah. Yes, that's the first one, for sure. All of the women's names here were survivors. All of the men. Well, you have a couple men who are survivors, but the men are historians, right? None of these books before the 80s were written by women, for sure. Yep, what else? Oh, 
plenty of people that's not really an issue. But like, that doesn't really change if you're one. Mm-hmm. It's Both, but yeah. It's legal. It's, it's policy. Yeah. It's a, it's a very deliberate policy. Yeah. Brutality maybe should be kept to refer to what happens to individuals. I think this is a really fascinating point um, because I think this is something that's happened in the last maybe 15 years in the scholarship, you know, with Jan Gross with Neighbors, with these books that start talking about what people did and not just what forces did and what policy did. And this is that, right? This isn't, for all of it going up the ranks and not being dealt with, this isn't uniform. This isn't a systematic issue. And we do tend to look at history as the study of the great men, right? And what they have done. And it's changing, thank goodness. But this is individual brutality. And that actually talks about not just on the perpetrator side, but that's on the victim side as well. Um, I had dinner with a couple of you last night and I said this at dinner, so I apologize for repeating myself. But it's been shown that it's easier to talk about a crime perpetrated against you as a member of a group than a crime perpetrated against you as an individual. And so when women talk about, and men, by the way, this is largely women, but men too suffered sexual violence during the Holocaust and its aftermath. When they talk about what the Nazis did to them as a Jew, as a communist, as a Pole, you're part of a group, you're safer. When you talk about what this Soviet soldier did to me as a woman, as a body, well, that's a lot harder, right? My grandma, when she talks about her rape, which now she does, she's still alive, she's 91, she blames herself because he came in and he went to the bed in this room that she's in with all these other girls and she happens to be the one in the bed that night. She hadn't been the one in the bed the night before, any of the nights before that, and this night she was, and so he took her because she's no longer a Jew, right? She's no longer one of a mass where you have this sense that this is happening to all of us together. It's much harder to talk about a thing that's just happening to you. Is that a hand? Yeah. yeah. I mean, a few things. I think, um, why is it not part of the narrative? I think one is that the Soviets were the, were the victors. Yes, very but important. The point is you had the Iron Curtain fall down. So you have yeah. this Yep. That you can't go and voice your criticism or opposition to Moscow. It doesn't happen. Right. Another point is, too, that um, I mean, there's an interesting film, it was a French um, Polish film, I think called The Innocence. But have you seen that? I don't know it. I'm very um, It's about the Russian rape of Polish nuns during World War II. Yeah. yeah. And it is based on a true story. Um, and also, too, I think the other part is women. Women, it was a shame. Women, were, it was their shame if they were raped. It's only now in the last few years or decade that women feel that they can even publicly say that they've been raped. And even so, there's still, women still face um, criticism when they do say, I've been raped. It's, a woman has to justify her innocence. Yeah. And I think that has a lot to play into it as well. Yeah, I think you've hit on a number of really important things. I'm going to start with the last one, which is these were women who weren't raised talking about sex at all. And as we know, you, you don't know how to talk about sexual violence if you, don't talk about, if you can't talk about sex. And if you can't talk about sex without shame, you certainly cannot talk about sexual violence without shame. And I will say I'm the mom of a small child, and this is something I think a lot about. Right? How do we change that? and make it so that people have an ability, the, the words even, to talk about these things. And then I'm gonna unpack a couple more of her things and then it's, it's okay. Um, and, and, and they don't, so the shame is huge. The first time my grandmother mentioned this in front of me, she was giving her testimony to a group of my military students. She was sitting across, at the other end of the, this long table from me, I will never forget this. And she paused and she broke from the story and she looked at me and she said, should I tell them? They're soldiers, they should know. 
And I nodded, and then she told them. We're very close, we talk about everything. She, she needed permission to say this in front of me, right? The shame is enormous. And it's on both sides. These are testimonies that I've been using today. They're videotaped testimonies. And you can't answer a question no one is asking. And the interviewers weren't asking these questions either. And then your point about who the Soviets are is really important, because the Soviets were the victors, and at this time, they're our allies. But there's also, I mean, when this is happening still, there's also a really strong theme throughout Holocaust testimony, and especially before the Iron Curtain fell down, and especially before we could start talking about the crimes of individual you know, um, collaborationist governments or collaborationist individuals, of, there is one perpetrator here. There is one evil here, and those are the Nazis. And we don't talk about what happened in France. We don't talk about what happened in Yadvabna. We talk about the Nazis. And this isn't the Nazis, and there's no place for it. Yeah, so thank you for that. The Soviet, the, we forget how much of an impact the geopolitics have on this, right? We expect these post-communist countries to be at the same place with their understanding of the Holocaust that we are, and they're decades and decades behind because they didn't have those decades to start thinking about it. You had a, another question, comment? Well, Yeah, I agree with you. And I think it's a brilliant way to put it. If you look back at the way Clara talks about it, she's trying to find a reason, right? Because the fear of saying, there was no reason, it just happened, these horrible things happen, is devastating. And I'll say to you also, I mean, we see this in many places here. I apologize for going back. Um, they had paid dearly for their victory, right? They had been dehumanized by their victory. And then the, the racialized way she blames this, that, that, that this is just who they are, it's a way of understanding. And one of the reasons I think historians don't talk about this is in part because they have no way to justify it. They talk a lot, as I said, about the rape of Berlin. They talk about, you know, they're angry at the Germans, they want to destroy the Germans. They've seen Germans kill and rape their families, so they're doing the same thing. These are defenseless women, it's a way to hurt the man. They're drunk, they're hungry. These, the, you, you, you hear, I can't tell you the number of times when you read about the rape of Berlin, you hear about the Soviet obsession with watches. I don't know if this is like a well-known thing, that they talk about these soldiers who are drunk and they're pillaging and they'll attack and rape and sometimes kill these women and they'll be wearing 10 watches they'll have stolen. And they're not equating, but they're connecting the sort of decadence of capitalist society and the wealth that the Soviets are seeing in Germany and are horrified by and very jealous of and very angry at their own government for keeping from them with these violent actions they take against women. That they're both ways of expressing this class-based and ideologically based rage. Which, all right, I mean, I'm not gonna get into, but there's no way, there's nothing that you can say. And I think it's part of the reason I talk about, remember what these women look like. Right? Remember they're wearing their camp uniforms. Remember that they're skeletons. Because all of the things we try to use to explain sexual violence, they don't stand here. There is simply no reason. 
And when we don't have a reason, we don't have a way to talk about it as historians. And I think for the women too, I think you're exactly right, that not having a way to understand it and not having a friend that you can say, oh, hey, did this happen to you too? Makes it very, very difficult. Yeah. Yes. And these women and children have been molested yep. and raped. Yep. And it has never been asked of them. And it's only slowly now trickling out their experience. And they're conflicted when they report those rapes and molestations because it's, well, I can't hate him. He rescued me. So I think that also plays into this kind of ambiguity of their situation, um, of their rapist, is yeah. also their savior. Yeah, I think it's a very important point. I think it's something we see in daily life too, right? Yeah, I mean, these the way that rela- the family relationships and power relationships, the way that sexual violence takes a role in them relies on this, right? The expectation that a friend of my grandmother's was abused by the family she was with in England. She was on the kinder transport. And the, it, was in, it was almost impossible for her to talk about any of it. Because, well, then who are these people? And what do I say? Is it good? Is it bad? And also, you're just a part of this bigger narrative, right? Oh, look, these 10,000 children taken in by these families. And then you think, well, the, the sadness and pain is the parents saying goodbye to them. It's not the vulnerability of these children. There's a lot, we have an expectation of this story. You know, when you ask a survivor their story, you expect a certain experience, you expect a certain villain, and none of this fits into that. As uh, women's history has changed, as we start to talk about women's history, um, you know, I, there's, there's a line that's always stuck out to me, that when they were building the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, they thought about having a room about women. Um, And Cynthia Ozick, who was on the committee, wrote Joan Ringelheim a note. And she said, I think what you were doing is wrong. Not right decision, wrong decision, morally wrong. Because we do not divide up the Holocaust experience in a way the Nazis didn't. Now, of course, we know now that's not true, right? The Nazis did treat women and men differently. Men with small children on the ramp at Auschwitz lived. Women with small children on the ramp at Auschwitz didn't. As an example, Hungarian men were sent to labor battalions. Women stayed in the ghetto, went to the camps. Again, as examples. But we've started to understand that there are all of these gradations to the history and that women's experiences as women have value, even if they also have experiences as survivors, as Jews, as whatever the other thing may be. I I think there was a hand here, and then I'll come back to you. And then I have four more minutes, because I promised you guys a bath. You didn't know. I promised you a bathroom break before the next one. Um, Did you have your hand up? the Nazis were in that at, at first um, through propaganda they turned your neighbors against mm-hmm. you and then they made you wear stars and then you end up in the camps and they shaved your head yeah. and all these incremental uh, degradations lead to this massive war and I hate to say it but I think there's a level of acceptance that this is all these horrors mm-hmm. um, are part of of war, yeah. and and we and today we watch the news and we see these horrible <laughs> films yeah. from the Mid East or Afghanistan or whatever, and we're so inured to it and jaded by it that um, it's just another piece of the immorality that exists during war. I think this is really important. So normally when I give this talk, I give this talk every year, uh, slightly differently, um, to military students. And this is a big part of what we talk about at the end. That one of the things we talk about is the way being a soldier requires dehumanization of yourself. You have to put aside your fear, you have to put aside your pain, you have to put aside 
your own ideology for the ideology of the system, which is good and bad. Um, but one of the bad things, I think, is this, that when you dehumanize yourself, and also when you're taught to dehumanize your enemy, my students at West Point, my old students at West Point, I don't teach them anymore, they, um, they were taught to call themselves managers of violence, not ironically. That's what they're taught, that that's their job, to manage violence. Right, that's what I think. I think it's incredibly disturbing, but very apt. But they have to dehumanize the enemy. Even our wars, even our military, right? None of this is, we're not immune from any of this. And that's why I would have this conversation with them, because how do you stop? When you have to start dehumanizing to do your job, how do you stop dehumanizing? And how do you make sure that the way you look at civilians recognizes their humanity? And also, I'm going to say, how do you make sure that the, the way you look at your enemies recognizes their humanity? Uh, so I think you're right. And, and I would say that this is one incidence, but there was mass rape in Yugoslavia. There was mass rape in Rwanda. 50,000 women in Rwanda were raped, is the estimate. I would say that probably doesn't include a lot of the women who died from it. It happened in Nanking. It happens all the time. Our armies are not immune from it. Our society is not immune from it, to it, to it, excuse me. We have to recognize the vulnerability of civilians, of women, of children, but of men too, in these systems and to think about all of the different reasons. Like we just talked about all of the different reasons that this may have happened. We have to think about what those analogs are in our lives today, in our wars today, in our culture today. Um, I am going to stop there. I'll be around during lunch if you have more questions or if you want to talk about this privately. Thank you for being a wonderful audience. Thank you for having me here today. Um, and uh, thank you.